are they booing about? Well, I don't know. Well, welcome to the Mindful Cranks. We're using your mind as not necessarily a bad thing. And we're being cranky can actually be mindful. Let's crank it up. Well, welcome to the Mindful Cranks. Uh, this is Ron Purser at San Francisco State University, and my colleague. Hi, I'm David Forbes. I am a counselor educator. I teach school counseling at Brooklyn College and also the City University of New York Graduate Center in Urban Education. Well, we're very happy today. We have uh, Professor Will Davies, who's at Goldsmith, the University of London today. And we'll be interviewing him about his book, The Happiness Industry, How the Government and Big Business Sold Us Well-Being, which was published by Verso Books in 2015. Uh, Will Davies uh, currently is senior lecturer in the Department of Politics. So welcome, Will. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we met last June. I was very fortunate. just uh, was kind of uh, by luck that you were giving a lecture there at, uh, I think it was the Cass Business School. That's right. And, uh, yeah, I think Andre, uh, Andre Spicer and Carl Sederstrom were there as well, the authors of the wellness uh, syndrome. So it was very interesting. Um, uh, could you tell us maybe, maybe a good way to start out is to tell us a little bit about your background and then maybe what led you to writing the happiness industry? Sure. My background is as an academic in sociology and economic sociology in particular – and before that, I worked in public policy in think tanks in London in the early 2000s. And I became interested while I was working in that environment in how particularly economics structures so much, so much of, our, of our political thinking and our public decision making. So what became my PhD and my first book, which is called The Limits of Neoliberalism, uh, was a study of uh, economic advisors to, in governments um, and regulators. And I was very interested really in how so much of our thinking about society and politics and culture is now channeled via economic categories of rationality, incentives, return on investment and so on. I mean, all of which is one word for that economization of our, of our lives would be neoliberalism. It's a slightly overused mm-hmm. word, but it's a word that I've used in quite a lot of my, my work. And then after I finished my PhD, or as I was finishing it, um, I started to try and understand how e- economists were with the global financial crisis that was breaking at that time, 2008-2009. And I noticed that one of the ways in which economics was basically being resuscitated in the face of this epic crisis, one of the ways in which it was being, I suppose, um, bolstered in certain ways was that it was engaging with particular fields of of psychology, behavioral economics, um, hedonic psychology, which feeds into happiness economics. Um, And I started to look at the ways in which economists in particular grab certain aspects of, of the mind, the brain, the body, um, uh, the, uh, aspects of, of choice, aspects of, uh, of emotions, in order to try and, um, I would say, prop up some of their theories that otherwise look rather rather vulnerable. And, and that was really what led me to start looking at, um, particularly within economics, the ways in which e- economists had 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 tried to draw on on certain traditions in psychology and and associated disciplines um, because really what i 'm interested in the happiness industry is not i'm not i 'm not against happiness i 'm right. not against um, <laughs> relaxation i 'm not against having a nice life or or, or being a, a a good citizen or a flourishing person i'm, I'm not a i 'm not some sort of strange nihilist um, I, I I like all of these things but what i what concerns me in the book is the way in which those um, aspects Aspects of human life and experience have become integrated into forms of economic calculation in particular. Yes. Um, I was really struck, you know, when I first got your book and I opened it up uh, almost immediately in the preface, uh, it starts out by uh, describing the World Economic uh, Forum meeting in Davos. 
And uh, I think this was 2014 meeting, and uh, um, a very elite uh, Tibetan monk, uh, Matthew Ricard, uh, mm. who's garnered the, the reputation in the media as being the happiest man in the world. Uh, <laughs> well, we know that even, you know, like last year, uh, the mindfulness guru, gurus were all the rage at Davos, including John kabat Um So it seems like Davos has become uh, this sort of like marketplace uh, for all sorts of entrepreneurs, uh, selling corporate mindfulness programs, apps, and gadgets. And, uh, and you even mentioned uh, some of the delegates, or maybe even all of the delegates at uh, Davos were given wearable gadgets to monitor their uh, their well-being during the conference. But I guess my question here is, uh, why do you think uh, uh, corporate uh, global elites are now enamored, not just with happiness, but also now with mindfulness? Well... There are lots of reasons for this. I mean, right. the, one of the simplest reasons is that the evidence on the the way in which happiness and uh, conversely um, unhappiness and depression affect economic productivity is rising all the time. And this is partly a result of the, the growth of the field of happiness economics and of, and of well-being economics and also of growing interest in well-being in, in the world of management – is that it's now it's no longer it's no longer simply a case of policymakers or managers saying yes well we we think that an enthusiastic workforce is probably a good good thing to aim for and it's probably good for our customers it's no longer just a sort of an instinct or an intuition there's now quite hard economic data on the connection between certain mental dispositions and uh, affective states and economic output um, and I mean one of the uh, most striking pieces of data on this. I mean, I would say that it's absurdly exaggerated, really, but that's kind of almost not the point. But is from from Gallup, which is um, obviously famous for being an opinion polling company, but has got very much um, into the space of of well being uh, analysis. And they calculated, and this is in 2012, I think, that um, what they call employee disengagement, which is a basically a psychological um, uh, attribute uh, is costing the U.S. economy five hundred billion dollars a year, um, which is um, a, an extraordinary claim to make. And I'm not quite sure how you could justify it, but I think what's more significant about that kind of claim is that it's going to make policymakers and 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 senior businessmen um, sit up and listen and care about the psychological state of their workforce. So I think there's a kind of basic economic um, justification for this. But I think there's possibly a, um, a, a broader cultural and philosophical transformation, which is, I suppose, in psychology comes from, from the, the history of cognitive psychology, but its particular influence of, of, of cognitive theories of the, of, of, the, of the human have a certain purchase within Silicon Valley where effectively um, the, the relationship between human beings and, and machinery is, is, is an open question. I mean, there's not anything in principle that, that, that machines can't do um, that we can do. Uh, and the question is really that the, the computers are going to do more and more things that humans do. Um, humans are going to have to sort of tend to themselves like pieces of equipment. And I think something like mindfulness in that context appears like a, a, a form of reboot in a way. It's a way of hitting the, 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 the kind of offs, you know, to, people say, have you tried turning it off and on again? I mean, that, that in a way is, the, is, is I think, within this cognitivist, uh, digital Silicon Valley worldview, I think that um, practices such as mindfulness uh, are, are ways of tending one's own human capital, if you like, but not for their own sake, but because it's a way of looking after the mind, the brain, the body in ways that can make it even more high. Yes, uh, I think we'll uh, probably get into that uh, deeper when we talk a little bit more about uh, uh, data analytics and wearable uh, technologies. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think you're alluding to that already. Um, I think what, uh, what you raise in the book to me is – you're bringing a, a much more of a sociological lens to this phenomena. Uh, and I think that, uh, at least in the field of psychology, and if we look at the, the we could say, the mindfulness industry at this point, uh, it, there's sort of a medicalization uh, of mindfulness. It's, it's sort of embedded 
uh, within the paradigm of biomedicine, and which is very reductionistic in nature. Yeah. I think you have uh, touched on a lot of these similar points in the book. Um, so what uh, would you say in terms of what we would gain by having more of a sociological lens than a psychological lens on this issue of uh, unhappiness or depression or I think I think the um, the simple answer to your question is that when people can understand that the sources of their unhappiness lie outside of themselves and by selves I mean mind, brain, body however you want to um, describe the self philosophically, but when when people can see the source of their unhappiness outside of themselves, this immediately has a a some type of liberating effect in the sense that it relieves individuals of their sense of responsibility and possibly their sense of guilt for um, for being an inadequate person in some way. Now, of course, it can also produce the opposite type of mm-hmm. effect, which is for people to be very, very angry with the world and to never take responsibility. Mm-hmm. Right. Hey, if you look at, in, in, in my country, Britain, there are a lot of um, uh, psychological programs used within um, workfare regimes to try and encourage greater uh, discipline amongst unemployed people and get them to be more active in their job seeking and so on. And, and a lot of it is all about trying to make them take responsibility. Um, and, 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 and I mean, perversely, it often treats them like children in the process by um, mm-hmm. giving them very small punishments for failing to do things they said they're going to do and so on. So, I mean, obviously, there's a kind of a, a spectrum between a, <laughs> a, a, a state of affairs where people feel that everything arises from within themselves and, a, and, a, and, a, and an equally um, uh, um, un- unhealthy state of affairs where people feel that, that nothing ever is, is their fault or comes from them or their body and so on. And, of course, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't ignore the medical dimension to mental health. But I think that, in a way, you see within the language of something like positive psychology that what people are grasping for and I think what a lot of positive psychologists understand but aren't able to quite articulate is that ultimately what helps people who are depressed is to stop taking feeling so alone with their with their with their state and to become engaged in something social and something altruistic. This is a key argument within positive psychology is be empathetic, be generous, you know, join a choir, start join a club go gardening, you know, whatever. I, I mean, all of those things are, yeah. are, are praiseworthy in, in their own way. But the problem is that the, 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 the register of success and failure in all of that is always comes back to how do I feel, how it's, what's going on with me, what's going on with my brain, what's going right. on with my body. And I think that there's a, there's a potentially liberating aspect to sociology, which is to offer people a language with which to see themselves as, as, as part of something larger, which doesn't have a yeah. loss of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 yeah. What, what, go ahead. What, what I appreciate is 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 is, is you're, you're 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 managing to put forth not just now but in the book in terms of this kind of a middle way as to see people as social beings and and I think you you, you really put your finger on the, you know trying to avoid the two poles. I mean, one one is obviously a kind of a vulgar um, determinism or vulgar Marxism that would say, well, everything is. Everything is, uh, out, you know, out, outside of you. It's not your fault. And as you said, you know, it, it sort of overrides individual responsibility and everything is, you know, economics. Uh, and, and I think some people might, might, if they're not careful, if they didn't carefully read your book or they don't really get the point, they might see that as, as, as one of the problems. The, the other extreme that we see with people with mindfulness is they have no... <laughs> Analysis or next to nothing about about notions of neoliberalism or, or, or you know that that, that the, the economy and the social structure um, are, are are out there and, and that they and to some extent we are we are part of that um, and so that everything is very individualistic and, th- and those are the kind of the two poles um, and and to be able to, to realize that that you know it's it's it's, it's neither pure privatized individual or or, or purely a s- sort of you know vulgar vulgar Marxist social determinism but that we 
we are social beings, and and yeah. and, that's, and, and as you describe some of the some of the social activities, uh, I mean that's that's the kind of the middle ground or the thread that we're I think that you you know you've really able to, been able to do in the book. Yeah, I mean there's a there's a there's another way of coming at this which I don't really use in the book, but I I published a, a co-authored a, a report with some colleagues last summer called Financial Melancholia, which was a study of <laughs> people with chronic debt and the effect it has on their mental health and it's i mean heart-wrenching um data we gathered from online forums of of people with problem debt and one of the phenomena that you you spot with people who have you know serious debt problems i mean which should sort of take over their lives is that they feel utterly responsible for it they don't have anyone right, right. to be angry with other than themselves and sometimes people in their 40s will say um, they'll pinpoint that they bought you know a sony playstation or something when they were 22 years old and they borrowed money to get it and then they didn't pay it off so they had to borrow more money and they have this sense that something in their past which they were responsible for um has has, has basically ruined their life and it's it's an awful thing to 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 witness um and this is the reason we call this financial melancholia is an allusion to Sigmund Freud's distinction between mourning and melancholia. And, and for Freud, it's a, quite a simple distinction, really, which I think does speak to some of the themes in my book, even though I, I don't use it in the book. But for Freud, um, you know, all human life involves loss and pain and suffering. But the question is, how, what do you do when you lose something? And losing um, a, a dream or it can be losing a possession or it can be losing anything, really. But it's a, it's a feature of humans that they have to occasionally accept that they've they had something and they no longer have it um and freud says you can either mourn it which basically means to 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 painfully let go but to basically by the end of the mourning process accept that the thing is 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 no longer part of your life and you've lost it and it's gone but but you but it's it's no longer it's not i mean you don't have it it's external to you or you can you can engage in what he called melancholia which is to which is to effectively seek that thing within the self and to turn in on oneself and 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 turn sort of hatefully and blamefully upon oneself um, and, and blame oneself for the fact that you don't have it anymore. So if you're not, you know, if you, if you think that um, Steve Jobs is the, is the measure of, of success in life and every day you go through that you're not Steve Jobs, you, you um, effectively are in a kind of melancholic state of, of, of blaming yourself, turning in on yourself, searching for, 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 for where this, this, the evidence of this dream, whereas an alternative might be to, to, to effectively mourn some kind of loss of a, of a, of a, of a effectively a rather kind of childlike dream uh, and to move on to a, to become a different person, basically, which is what psychoanalysis offers, but it's also what yeah. processes of mourning offer. Yeah. And, and, and the, I mean, that, that's, that's, that ideology is, is neoliberal. I mean, to, to, to internalize the idea that you're, you're always responsible for yourself. And I know somewhere in your book, you, you talk about how there are, there are hidden um, cultural assumptions. I mean, and that's that's one that I, I see in counseling that, that people naturally tend to blame themselves for, for mm-hmm. things that are that if we, if we step back in, in a sociological perspective or framework, we could see that it's you know it's not just it's not you. It's not you know there are other people going on. There are it's, it's a sort of classic C. Wright Mills argument. You know that yeah. is when when one person is unemployed, okay, but when thousands of people are unemployed, there, there's something going on here. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a general trend, uh, basically, uh, from our perspective, is this psychologizing of yeah. mi- mindfulness. Yeah. It's, it's an inward turn, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and, and basically the, the side effect of that is, is, as you say, Will, is the depolitali- de- de- depoliticizing, uh, uh, basically, the, the phenomena. So, uh, I mean, David Gellers, who is the author of Mindful Work, he's a New York Times reporter, he even made some statement that, you know, stress is just a personal problem. It's not something outside of you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think the problem, as you're raising, is that it, it's diverting attention away from looking at the political, social, economic context. Um, yes. I think uh, it might be a good time now to maybe turn our attention to my favorite chapter in your book uh, is The Psychosomatic Worker, <laughs> which ahead. is a great title. Um, uh, and I... I really like it because I, I uh, spent some time a few years back uh, kind of digging into some of the uh, archival data on my, uh, Mayo, Elton Mayo, and yeah. very different than uh, the textbook accounts uh, that you read in, of the Hawthorne studies. Um, 
So maybe maybe just a general question, just to kind of ease our way in, is what, uh, could you unpack, or what do you mean by uh, the psychosomatic worker? What are some of the issues here that you're trying to explore? Well, I suppose one of the interesting things, I mean, this, this chapter actually began um, as an article in the New Left Review in 2011 called The Political Economy of Unhappiness, which is actually what led to the to the to getting the book contract with Verso and everything. Um, and I was interested in in that article, which then fed into this book chapter, in the way in which these strange forms of, of psychosomatic collapse had become a very serious problem for businesses in the in the developed capitalist world. Um, and I mean I was looking particularly initially at data from the UK, but you know, that actually you know the the, the the sheer cost of people falling into forms of um, fairly uh, complex, chronic, psychosomatic um, forms of inactivity, which can be a combination of depression, anxiety, you can call it stress. Sometimes in certain areas of the population, it will, it will, it will um, also include things like chronic obesity and, and sort of basically kind of just people falling into forms of inactivity that then saddle, well, particularly in a country like Britain, which has a, a, a socialized health care system, this is a serious public policy problem because of the cost this creates um, for the state. Um, but equally, forms of psychological disengagement and, uh, and, and, and health-related absence from work, a serious problem for employers. Um, and the concept of stress, and I, I go a little bit into the history of the concept of stress in that chapter by looking at um, uh, Hans Selye, who was one of the um, godfathers of psychosomatic medicine. Um, you know, this concept of stress, which, I mean, you know, interestingly enough, in the, around about the time of the Second World War, or even until the 1950s or 60s, the word was something which really was meant, was meant came from engineering and physics. So if you, the word stress was used to refer to something that a, a steel beam could could experience a certain amount of stress or whatever. Um, and it was partly thanks to Selye that it became applied within the realm of, of biology and, and psychosomatic medicine um, to imply some kind of demand that is placed upon a a, um, a complex biological system, such as a, a human body or a, or a, or a you know, a, a, it could even be a, a human community. I mean, we now hear a lot about this word resilience is another, another term that, that, that has cropped up, although I don't really talk about it in the book. But, I mean, you know, stress is, a, is an interesting phenomenon politically, I think, and culturally in that it, it doesn't really articulate itself in any clear way. It's not, it, it, I mean, it's something that people in human resources are terrified of the idea of stress because it involves people um, sort of, you know, the, the, the diagnosis is unclear, the symptoms are unclear, mm-hmm. but um, clearly it has a political element to it. Um, and this was quite well recognized in the earlier um, era of occupational health uh, analysis in the 1960s, a very famous study in the UK done by Michael Marmot called the Whitehall Study, where he looked at um, uh, uh, cortisol levels in the blood, which is a quite a good uh, indicator, biomarker of stress, uh, and found that actually people um, with very low levels of autonomy and responsibility and power in the workplace actually suffered more stress than those at the top. It's just that, and, and this was, and this was, a, a, this clearly has political implications about the distribution of power in our economy. Um, what, one thing that's happened actually since the 60s uh, is that um, actually <laughs> increasingly the concept of executive burnout has, has come to the fore yeah. a lot more because everybody gets, you know, there's something rather sort of, we, 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 we see our executives as, as these sort of heroes who, who who need to be treated like Formula One cars and constantly <laughs> and, and, and sort of polished, whereas actually the fact that maybe working on minimum wage uh, with a family and having precarious job um, contracts and so on actually is probably a lot more stressful. Um, so there's a politics to stress, but one of the problems with it, and I think in some ways this is partly about the, the political shifts of, of, of neoliberalism, if you want to call it that, is that it doesn't, they're not articulated. They get, they get sort of, stress is a kind of silent disorder in lots of ways, um, as is depression to, to a great extent. It, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. articulate itself in a set of, instead of demands or a set of, um, or in outrage or in anger. It's much no. more of a, of a form of collapse, I suppose. It's, it's turned inward. Yeah. Yeah, and I I think the, you make a really good point in the book about the, it's it's sort of a gray area, uh, kind of a nebulous border between what counts as uh, 
disengagement and what counts as a clinical disorder. So mm-hmm. it's a very kind of ambiguous ground for, as you say, yeah. uh, HR people and, and, and things like that. Well, I think uh, there are all sorts of areas where using diagnosis becomes a way of trying to simplify what is not simple. So, I mean, I, where I work in a, in a, I'm an academic and I have a, have a role in my department at Goldsmiths I'm, um, where I deal with a lot of um, pastoral issues involving students who um, are basically struggling with in ver- on various fronts. And often the reason they're struggling are complex. They're partly financial, partly to do with their private lives, partly to do with their working lives and so on. And, and they're just often they're just not keeping up properly. And that's partly what being young is about in, in, in you know being at university is sometimes you get a bit lost and you get you sometimes you feel a bit like you're all at sea. Um, but with the greater pressure now on students and Fee, like high fees have come in in the last mm-hmm. ten years in Britain, which which didn't exist when I was I was a student, um, and increasingly getting some kind of diagnosis becomes a way in which they can actually um, sort of navigate the system in a way that works for them in some way. That's not to say that these that these symptoms are not real, but I think there's a question about whether you make the jump from having certain symptoms such as, oh, I've just been lying in bed for three days and so on, and, oh, you know, I'm eating too much or something, to making the leap to a diagnosis. And, of course, in, in the United States context, this has its own particular historical and cultural context as well in, in, in terms of having a, a more privatised healthcare system, but also the way in which the pharmaceutical industry and the regulatory system and the, uh, uh, have are all kind of interlocking such that... Um, more and more diagnoses are arising, and, and, and as, as you'll have seen, I, I talk a bit about the, the, the um, DSM-3, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of 1980, which, which changed a lot of this in the, case, in the case of mental health. So I think one of the, the key things is, you know, thing like work is a is a is a biopsychosocial side type of activity, and. And the forms of pain that work creates, and the forms of alienation that it creates, are themselves biopsychosocial. But it's, but, but I think people reach for biological and and, and psychological types of um, definition and analysis and explanation because they seem to clean things up and tidy things up in a way that um, means that the 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 the, the, the cultural and political dimensions of of, of an organisation can be ignored. Right. I'd like I'd like to touch on that then because um, this this chapter is uh, really connects the dots I think historically, and uh, going back to the history of management science, uh, I think we we see this this continuous quest uh, for the holy grail, and what I mean by that is the the yearning for a hard science of of workplace happiness, and I think uh, this is where all the problems begin in a way. Um, yeah. And and I really like how you brought up uh, the role of of management gurus uh, in this uh, endeavor, and, and you know Mayo I think was a, quite an ex- example of that in terms of yeah. that he reduced all employee problems, all sort of workplace descent to to neuroses. Mm. Uh, yeah, and and and, and it, so it, it seems like there's a continuity here through history. That we, we see these declarations. I wrote an article about this in the latest Tricycle magazine. Uh, but we see these declarations that this is a revolutionary now management program that is going to uh, basically get everybody on board. Everyone's going to be socially harmonious. Um, mm-hmm. What do you see, uh, Will, in terms of, of that continuity? Well, I think always since the Management is a, is a is a curious thing because I mean, management rests on 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 a on a management rhetoric is always ironic in some way because it never quite says what it really means or it's really doing. It's the management is always in the in somehow in the in the role of of. Of, of, of trying to inculcate cooperation and, and productivity and a sense of collective identity, but in ways that is for some instrumental goal that is never, you know, that, that doesn't get, get spoken of. Public. The, bo- the bottom um, line. No, right, yeah. I mean, um, now, 
you could say um, someone like Frederick Taylor, who I talk about in that chapter, who is often seen as the fir- world's first management guru. I mean, he treated human beings basically like machines, which at least had a certain sort of transparency about it. Yeah, very uh, more honest. <laughs> well, in a way, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I think um, one of the things I, I suggest in the chapter as well is that the, this rise of wearables, which I think is far, far more intrusive than anything Taylor could have imagined, because it um, it kind of tries to get inside the body and the, the you know to, to the heart rate and 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 to the emotions and um, social analytics of what people are putting into their email and so on. Um, so, but in a way, there's a kind of you could almost say there's a sort of resuscitation of, of Taylor's. I mean, I think the I think the, the there's there's a very good. Um, article called uh, Design and Devotion. Uh, I can't remember who it's by, but it's a, it's a history of management. It's a single article, but it's a, it's, a, it's a theorization of the history of management, which suggests that it basically swings between these poles of, of, of a kind of empathetic style and a harsh rationalist style, and that neither of these ever quite works, and therefore it kind of swings back to the other one. So it kind of goes from Taylor around about the time of the First World War through to Mayer in the 1930s, then it goes back to, to the behaviorism and the, 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 um, organi- the, the, what was it called, systems, systems theory, theory of, the, yeah. of the 1960s, and then that fails, and then you get this, this rise this more, um, the, of the crazy gurus, the sort of Tom Peters and the Michael Porter sort of stuff of the 1980s, uh, and that it's this sort of constant swinging backwards and forwards. Um, I think the the way I see management rhetoric and management gurus is that they are um, professional simplifiers. Um, and I think everybody needs simplification in their lives. Um, and there are times when you need it so badly that you'll pay someone to... Um, to, to, to help you do it. And if they seem to be very, very confident of, 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 of their way of simplifying things, then that's going to be worth more money than someone who seems a bit tentative about it. So in a way, someone who said, oh, it's complicated, and I don't know, it's probably a bit social and a bit psychological and a bit cultural, and it probably stems from the long history of this, that, and the other. That person's not going to command much much money in the management guru market because they're not, they're not, they're not performing the, the simplification. And I think um, there, there's often the, the coming up with the driver of, of your employee behavior or your consumer behavior because I also have a chapter in the book um, about marketing, market research, advertising, and so on. Um, coming up with these simple drivers is is always going to be a, a there's always going to be something quite seductive about it, and then it tends to disappoint in the long run. Um, but people build their careers and their, their their personal brands on having a you know a big idea, and at the moment there's a huge number of um, startups and. Um, uh, happiness gurus and so on and, and, and happiness optimizing consultancies and so on who you, you, the alarm bells always ring for me when they when they refer to the word science we use science <laughs> and you sort of think well science isn't just some sort of kind of magical potion that you just sprinkle on things i mean, I mean what they're referring to is is is, is, is forms of behavioral science or it's often neuroscience and so on but i mean again i mean the, the at its at its most at its crudest um people there's this there's this concept in in marketing that we're going to uncover the brain's buy button which is you know i mean that's mm-hmm. that's yeah. probably doing a, a disservice to some of the more subtle people in the world of, of, of management and, and market research. But, um, but of course, I think that a, a degree of, of, of simplification and reductionism is, is the stock and trade of, of this as an industry. Right. Yeah. And uh, you, you do kind of raise that point in the book that uh, the role of these management gurus and, and I would say mindfulness gurus now in, in, in terms of also like shifting the discourse, right, away from more political and philosophical issues. Uh, to, to more like performativity and managerialism, mm. um, but yeah, there is always that appeal uh, to science, uh, but the empirical evidence is questionable. And at the same time, uh, there is sort of almost like a nebulous border between uh, what they're calling evidence and, and ideology. Yeah. Um, so they and yeah, rumors circulate as well. I mean, what what counts as evidence gets gets sort of rather warped as it travels through certain networks. I think also uh, historically we see this almost like messianic zeal. Uh, I mean, Mayo thought he was going to save democracy, 
or actually mm. he was sus- suspect, suspicious of democracy in many ways. But he, he thought that his methods, his human relations methods, would uh, basically save society from socialism. Um, mm. And we see these grandiose sort of uh, messianic visions of some of these gurus uh, over yeah. time. Um, and I think, uh, as you said, was it Hans Sel- Selly? Yeah. Uh, he had the same sort of uh, grandiose vision. Yes. I mean, I think having a, having a uh, as you say, this, this messianic is is something that probably does characterize a lot of these management gurus i mean um uh i think um exactly where that where that comes from depends from 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 case to case i think i mean there are economists as well who who have a similar motivation the person who's done most to put happiness on the policy agenda in britain is an economist called richard layard who um is i think a kind of entirely well intentioned but he mm-hmm. he really thinks that his 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 economic measures of happiness are he doesn't just see them as 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 behavioral data which i mean i because I, I don't deny that that happiness surveys capture something of some interest and i think sometimes they capture something of, of a lot of interest they can often reveal things that we didn't previously know i'm not i don't i'm not some sort of um utter um Postmodernist who thinks that this type of data is just a kind of fiction, um, but at the same time, I, I, I recognise the difference between data and um, on, on behaviour and transcendent truths about humanity. Um, and um, yet, someone like Layard, he's probably not a great philosopher. He's probably a, probably a very good economist, but he, he sort of often jumps seamlessly from talking about. Um, well, we've got this data and these, these statistics talking about, well, this is why we need a new secular religion for our age. And, you know, and, and it's sort of a, um, it's, the, it's the jump from one to the other that, that slightly concerns me. But I think being a management guru is partly about, I mean, he's not a management guru, he's an economist, but some of these other management gurus, partly what they sell is the, the injection of a sort of, um, uh, it is precisely that that messianic that that force of post personality or, or what the sociologist Max Weber called charismatic authority, um, where you simply kind of want to obey someone because of the effect they have on you. And I think that the sheer belief of someone like Mayo, for instance, would have been their sheer self confidence and their sheer belief that they knew the truth would have been partly what what um, uh, granted them the influence that they did. Yeah. And I think uh, maybe what your book is is addressing in, in terms of as you're looking at basically a, criti- a critical uh, perspective on the on the science of happiness is that we we seem to have ended up in in some sort of state of cultural relativism, uh, almost like an ethical and moral vacuum in society. So, do you think that's why there's been such a a rush to to this? Uh, this this trend of the science of happiness in terms of why why do we want to quantify and scientize all our sentiments and feelings and motivations? What's I suppose I mean the, you know there are different there are different philosophical traditions here. I think yeah. there's a there's a there's a very um, scientific rather amoral tradition, which I guess is more important to my book, which is the one that comes from the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham from the late 18th mm-hmm. century. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. The reason someone like Bentham thought we should quantify happiness was that it was effectively a, a, a superior alternative to getting involved in politics, basically, <laughs> to put it crudely, um, was that for Bentham, if we sit around trying to work out what counts as good and bad and just and unjust and so on, we're going to get distracted by lots of lots of noise and lots of rhetoric, and um, we're never going to achieve any type of progress because we're going to be constantly distracted by um, uh, kind of you know intellectual concepts and moral language and so on. And incidentally, someone like Bentham was was quite a hero to people like Milton Friedman and, and, and the, sure. neo, the American neoliberals because they also saw as what they were doing. Their, 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 their mission, in a way, was precisely to try and rescue, I suppose, America first and foremost from, from all of the 
mm-hmm. sort of dangerous good intentions and rhetoric of, of, of liberals with all of their um, talk about society and community and equality and the public and all that sort of stuff, yeah. which yeah. for those of a, of a Benthamite persuasion, which I think most members of the Chicago School of Economics were, all of that language is, does more harm than good. And it's better to, to stick to, to, to a hard science of, of human behavior and human um, choice uh, than it is to, to to try and act on behalf of of, of the of the common good in some way, um, and then but then of course there's also I suppose the, the the tradition that starts with Aristotle, which is the tradition of of um, virtue ethics or, uh, or or the study of of what Aristotle called eudaimonia, which is a term which is sometimes translated in happiness, but it doesn't it means something closer to to, to, to flourishing or something like that. Um, and I think that this is very attractive in an age of, of moral relativism and an age of consumerism and, and, and so on, because it, 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 it holds out the, the ideal of, of being able to live a good life that has substantive meaning for one and mm-hmm. gives you direction and makes you who you fundamentally are. It's a kind of an existential philosophy as much as anything else. Um, but I think that what often happens is that that Benthamite tradition of, which is mm-hmm. fixated on numbers and behaviour and incentives and all that sort of stuff often gets rather conflated with the Aristotelian one um, mm-hmm. I mean there are people who I, who I have <laughs> far too much respect for to, 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 to accuse of this like people like Amartya Sen, the economist but, um, who, who, would, who would be perfectly able to um, distinguish between the two but I think there are, there are others in the space of, of happiness economics who, who often think that we can sort of have both of these things at once, that we can, you know, with enough data, we'll work out what is the right way to live our lives, um, which is, I think, is, is, is just plainly false on an ethical and philosophical level. Um, but I think it's also has bad feedback effects as well, because I think what happens is that it then becomes... Um, manager or a, or a policymaker to start effectively trying to manipulate someone into changing the way they live mm-hmm. because they say, well, I've got data that it's going to be better for them in some way. And that, in a way, is where something like the whole nudge um, agenda comes from is, well, you know, I, 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 I can prove to you that you're going to be happier if you've got a pension and you've, um, you're hanging out more with, with your family and you're going to spend more time with, you know, you're going to do your recycling or whatever. I, I know what your, what your good life looks like and therefore I'm going to try and tweak your environment and manipulate you via whatever it might be, social media or something, to, to, to change the way you live. Now, it may be the case that those people are right, but um, I'm not sure that that necessarily makes those sorts of interventions justifiable. There's, a, there's another implicit ideology underneath Bentham, I think, which is the, the, this notion of homo economicus. I mean, the idea that every individual is, 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 is self-centered and greedy and only out for him or herself. And I, I think I think in your book you mentioned Bentham in terms of reward and punishment. I mean, that it's, it's, it's kind of a very, in, in terms of developmental models, a very early stage of... Of, of development in terms of well, I, I'm only going to do things for reward or punishment, and mm-hmm. and it, it it definitely you know it's it's kind of like like Thatcher. I mean that there is no alternative. It's like well, everybody's an individual. There's no society, and and a lot of those are kind of again to go back to the earlier point is is, is implicit uh, assumptions that, that that aren't spoken about. Um, I mean that's 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 one concern. And the the other is what, what I learned in psychology. Years ago, is that is that you know a lot of the studies often rely on 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 the subjects not knowing uh, mm-hmm. what what the experimenters are doing. In other words, in, analogously, the ma- management. It's like your your you're just your latest example was well, you know, I have this I have this data that you know you, you know I'm going to manipulate people, uh, mm-hmm. and, but but I wonder if if people more democratically. Uh, understood what was going on in terms of what, what what's management's intentions and uh, and objectives, and um, and had the same access to the same data, they wouldn't necessarily uh, choose what what management is trying to, to do for them. It's- yeah, I mean, there's there's huge. I think this problem is 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 kind of is, is growing very very rapidly at the moment. Where I mean, I have a chapter in the book called "Living in the Lab," which is partly mm-hmm. about these sorts of power inequalities that you're alluding to, which, of course, yes, from a a classically behaviorist psychological perspective, 
it's important, uh, which, I mean, you know, ben, Bentham's famous for his model of the prison, the panopticon, where the, pr- the prison guard can see the prisoners, but not vice yeah, versa. Yeah, and that is it. after all, say, how a, most yep. behavioral experiments are set up or focus mm-hmm. group, you know, it's sort of, so there's this, there's this um, inequality of, of visibility that, that one set of people are being observed, but they're not observing the, the they're not, they don't see the observer. Um, yes. And I think that this is, this is becoming endemic all over our society. If you think of, um, I mean, if you, I, I, I've been looking a little bit at wearable technology more recently since writing the book, and you take a, there's an app called Map My Run, which is a very simple thing, which <laughs> just tells you where you've been jogging, um, and you can quite, you know, you can you get the result after all. It's not it's not like keeping the result secret from you, but. Apparently, this data is shared with 36 other companies just when you go for a jog. And, <laughs> um, and this is un- unknown to you. So that's, that's a sort of issue which arises as a privacy issue. But when you think about the rise of what's often referred to as the Internet of Things, which is that effectively the monitoring of, of human movement, physiological movement, um, transport and so on, and uh, physical objects in our society. It, it, all, as more and more of this gets monitored, the cognitive capacity of those doing the monitoring, and I mean that in a, in a, in a human and non-human sense, not in a, in a sort of psychological sense, but in a, in a kind of computational sense, is going to rise so rapidly while mm. the cognitive capacity of, of everybody else if, is, is just going to pretty much, okay, of course we get our, you know, I have Google Now as a kind of dashboard which tells me when it's time for me to go to the airport and that sort of stuff on my phone. And, you know, I have, I have my Google Calendar and I have my Facebook account and so on. So it's not that the, 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 the rest of us aren't in any way getting forms of feedback, but the, but the inequality of, of, mm-hmm. of feedback between those who control the platforms versus those who use them is just growing so wildly at the moment that it's going to become harder and harder to, to, to say, well, hang on, a, you know, if, if someone says, well, actually, I think this is going to be good for you and I think this is going to, this, you're going to like this and you're going to, you're going to benefit from this, it becomes harder and harder to argue back. And one of the, one of the sort of I suppose it's stranger examples, it's rather disturbing in a way, which I mentioned in the book, is um, something which the behavioural, the, the, well, he's a, he's a legal scholar, uh, Cass Sunstein, but he's also one of the authors of Nudge. He has a new book called Choosing Not to Choose, and he's interested in the conditions under which people will surrender their uh, right to make choices to, uh, to basically um, paternalist Forces, which he kind of assumes will be democratically elected governments. He has this sort of rather, um, rather nice liberal vision of, of, of where power lies in society, uh, rather than with Facebook or something far worse or Uber or something. Um, uh, uh, but you know, he, he, one of the examples he looks at is what he calls predictive shopping, which is the idea that instead of having to say, "Well, I, you know, I like this and this and this," stuff would just arrive in your house on the basis of an algorithmic. <laughs> analysis of your of your previous behavior and that didn't that wouldn't even have to be your previous shopping behavior it could be what you'd said online it could be um you know, you know what 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 shows you'd been to it could be anything really it could be once your house is smart it could be the way you use your fridge it could be the way you use your car whatever um and he analyzed this as a from the perspective of a of a of a, of a quite a gentle pragmatist ethical philosophy um but didn't seem to have any a sort of sociological critique of the fact that actually society is heading towards more and more and more of this sort of thing, and you know, we, are we going to just sort of give give into it? Well, I mean, I'm not sure why I have the alternative, but at the same time, I don't want to to, to just sort of assume that that these that these things are benevolent entirely. So it it sounds like that uh, with this uh, explosion of uh, digital uh, analytics and wearable technologies and surveillance technologies that uh, it, it seems like a, it's like an almost like an utopian vision of a, of a managed society of sorts or uh, some sort of new form of social engineering. I mean, that's, yeah, ma- I think yeah ma- ma- managed by just a few people. That's the point. Right. Well, I don't think, yeah, I mean, again, I, I, some people have called me paranoid for writing this book. <laughs> and, um, I don't, but, and I know it sounds paranoid, but I think it's becoming more and more plausible every year. I mean, already, I, I've already, I flick through the book sometimes. And, um, when, you know, I finished it in sort of uh, whatever, autumn twenty. 20- 14. And already I think some of it looks terribly outdated and, and rather innocent. I mean, I, I think it's moving so quickly at the moment um, in, the, in relation to wearables, in relation to 
I mean, there's a useful new concept has arisen recently, um, which is surveillance capital, which was a, a, a concept that I suppose really um, the, it was the Edward Snowden revelations that partly um, gave rise to this concept. Because, but it's it's effectively the you know the the it, what it tries to capture is the fact that there are businesses out there now where um, their entire business model depends on surveillance, um, and um, that surveillance is not. Um, uh, uh, the, the kind of way we imagine Cold War surveillance. It's not sp- people spying on people and it's not trying to catch bad guys or dissenters. It's a different, it's an entirely different form of surveillance. It's much more blanket. It's also often dr- presented in a, in a very benevolent way. Um, I mean, one thing which Michel Foucault, I think, taught us in the 70s was, I mean, there's a moment in, in an interview with Foucault where he says, power couldn't work if it only ever said no in order to work power has to sometimes you know has to often say yes i mean power has to has to do things for us and give us things in order to work it can't purely repress us or 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 frighten us um and i think that the, the 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 appeal of whatever it might be uber or facebook or wearable technology is undeniable i don't i'm i I, i'm not claiming that the pleasures these things grant are fake or in some way but i think that the um they 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 operate in certain contexts and certain grids of of data gathering and calculation that you know i i place within this longer history dating back to to bentham um but i at the moment i I, it's 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 expanding at at a at a rate that i i find quite extraordinary and um it's really very difficult uh, short of these leaks which occasionally seem to throw our politics into a certain amount of havoc every now and then it's difficult to know exactly what what resistance to them looks like yeah i i think it might be good to perhaps close our interview with some reflective comments on your last chapter because uh, I'll read one sentence which uh, really sh- struck out at me. Uh, it's called, Critique will not show up in the brain, which is not to say that nothing happens at a neurological level when we exercise critical judgment. I think that it's, that sentence says a, a whole lot in, in, in very short amount of words. Um, and uh, this podcast is called The Mindful Cranks. It's kind of a, a hilarious uh, take on um, appropriating uh, someone who called me a crank, actually. Mm. Um, but but there is this uh, there is this tendency I think in our society that anyone who tries to offer a critique is seen as negative or mm. unhappy or a crank. Um, mm. What what's going on in that last chapter of yours? It's called Critical Animals. Mm. Um, yes, I mean critique. The word I mean the word critique is obviously often conflated with with criticism and it, yeah. i mean it doesn't quite mean the same thing and it, i mean critique really the closest the, the word the word um critique comes from the greek word uh, crisis or uh, crisis i don't know you pronounce it exactly but which means something more like judgment or turning point um a little bit like how you say someone's in a critical state in hospital it means that they're at the point where it's either going to go one way or the other and i think i mean as someone who's who's been interested in in, in european philosophy uh, over the years um the idea of critique it played a very important role within the the tradition of of people like kant um and uh, adorno and horkheimer in the in the mm-hmm. 30s 40s and 50s and uh, and so on um and karl marx um and i think that what it tries to in a sense what 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 the task of critique is is to is to sort of distinguish that which is kind of good from that which is bad really um and i think that um and partly what you know partly the challenge of writing a book like this is that the happiness industry itself is is not all bad i mean this is one thing which i say to people uh, over and over again is i'm not against all of this i'm not against trying to help people who are suffering i'm not against trying to you know of course it's better that people have 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 sort of pleasant workplaces than the miserable work right we we, we we run up against that same sort yeah, of uh, yeah all yeah. the time it, yeah. it's such yeah. a common it's such a common critique um or common sort of slander really but um yeah. and and in a way that the task of, of critique is to is to is to try and carve those kind of paths to try and work yeah. out what a a, a more um, emancipatory version of this agenda might look like, but in terms of individuals themselves, I think that um, 
I suppose what I'm what I'm getting at is that there might be something is that recognizing that human beings have the capacity to look outwards upon the world, look outwards upon their, their circumstances and upon other people, and to not only act judgmentally. I mean, you know, being being judgmental, being critical is not something you want to do it, 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 the whole time. Um, but that um, you know, they don't they don't just have experience. You know, the the, the, the happiness and, and suffering. Um, aren't just these sorts of things that rise and fall in them like blood pressure in the way that someone like Elton Mayo or, or, and many contemporary happiness economists would, would assume. It's not, it's like not just serotonin in the brain, but actually the, if something's making you unhappy, that this, can, this might actually be the prompt for other more outward-oriented um, uh, emotions, but also statements, um, and they might be statements of anger, and they might be statements of judgment, and they might be statements that say, well, this situation is not right, and I'm not going to accept the situation. And in a way, that's what I think being critical means. It doesn't mean being, no, no, I don't like this, in a sort of just negative way, but it can mean, a, it can also be a, I, I'm not prepared to accept this, and I demand something to be done differently. Because in a way, you, maybe you could say this is the rise of Bernie Sanders or something. It's a sort of, you know, it's a resuscitation of a of a of a of a, of a, of a some type of critical orientation amongst a younger generation or something. But you know, that people people refuse to accept things to just remain the same year in year out. That actually there might be something mentally and who knows even physically healthy about that. Yeah, that's that's kind of yeah. what we we've been working on is to uh, yeah. shift the discourse and sort of raise these sort of questions to, to uh, expand uh, individual therapeutic mindfulness to much more of a, you could say, a social mindfulness mm. or critical mindfulness, a civic mindfulness, where mm. questions of uh, power come into play. It's sort of, um, you know, using Foucault's self-care in, a, in, in the critical direction, not in the direction of the California cult of the self. Mm. We're, 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 see, we're seeing with mindfulness... We're seeing that the way mindfulness is used, as Ron said, it's, it's in a very therapeutic way. It's very, it's only yeah. turned inward. There's no, yeah. there's no sense of, of what's uh, in it for of, me. Yeah. What's in it, yeah, it's all what's in it for me. There's no social being. And and the second thing, is, it, it it gets implicitly confl- because there's no analysis, it gets conflated with with uh, with uh, uh, capitalist or managerial or, or neoliberal ideology. It's not it's not seen. It's like it's an invisible quality and then and then the third thing we encounter which has turned us into cranks is is that is that people get uh don't see those things and they they don't see they don't they can't step outside of their own attachment to to mindfulness yeah. uh, as almost a belief and they don't see they don't see the larger social and political and cultural context um and 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 they get very defensive uh, you know they 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 can't they can't stay with I mean they're not very mindful about their own discomfort with negativity I mean we've had yeah. some reactions on Facebook that people say oh I'm tired of all this uh, negativity you know and, and we, what we're doing is we, in, in, we think in terms of your definition of critique is, is to, to raise questions and to, to 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 make look at this larger you know as people as mindfulness isn't as a social activity within a social context and a lot of people can't hear it they can't. And, and they themselves aren't aware that, that they're not being very mindful about their own discomfort with uh, yeah. their own defensiveness and their own neg- and their own um, inability to, 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 to see how attached they are. Yeah, I, I think uh, we, maybe we can end on a happy note by <laughs> saying that <laughs> happy, happiness. happiness and critique are not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. Um, critique well, we'll, makes me we'll, happy. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll I, <laughs> that's a good one. Thank you so much for... Uh, taking the time yes, uh, yes, to be you. on uh, the Mindful Cranks and uh, really all. appreciate it. We will uh, be posting uh, uh, your book on the show notes and, and other information. People will want to get mm-hmm. in touch with you, your your website and so forth. So thank you, Will. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This thank is you. the Mindful Cranks and the end of our interview with Will Davies, the author of The Happiness Industry. <laughs>